Um, so welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm Whitney Carr. I'm the Adult Services Manager at Bexley Public Library, and we're so excited to have Beth Armstrong with us to talk about her book, Voices from the Ape House. Beth Armstrong, she began her career in the zoo field as a keeper at the Columbus Zoo, working her way up to head keeper of gorillas. While working as a keeper, she became increasingly involved in building the zoo's support of in situ uh, conservation, culminating in becoming the first field conservation coordinator at Columbus. In 1995, she co-founded the first ZAC, which is Zoos and Aquariums Conference. And since then, she has advised and helped organize the last 25 years of ZAC conferences and currently chairs the ZAC Steering Committee. And in 2016, she also founded Finding Your Voice, uh, inspirational stories from women who protect wildlife and wild places, which is a conservation summit bringing together un university and high school students, zoo personnel, reps from NGOs to mentor the next generation of conservationists through stories and life experiences. And the third uh, summit was in 2019 at Otterbein. So thank you again for coming back. And uh, well, thank you for asking me. Thank you. Thanks everyone for signing up for tonight. Um, I'll give you the gist of how we're going to sort of run down through this. I'm going to do a very brief reading from the book and then I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation just to give you a little bit of background on gorillas, uh, but also on why, it, for me, why it was important to write uh, their story. And then I'm going to show you some videos at the end, which I think really is usually the best part because you you get to see the gorillas um, as they are, as we saw them on, an, on a daily basis. So let me begin first with this reading. And this is from uh, chapter 21, Humans and Gorillas. And it's a description of juvenile gorillas. And it probably sounds a little bit familiar to some of us who have teenage kids or um, teenage uh, nieces and nephews. Okay. Juvenile males seemingly suss out situations, calculate the trouble they can cause, then they have at it. They are masters of, of ornery, naughty for the sheer delight of it. And once again, because adults are so tolerant, only the most egregious antics will be dealt with. Gorillas that age are hard driving play machines, goofy in their exuberance. They are oftentimes born with little or no body hair and with spidery looking limbs. Then they slide smoothly into a stage of being just beautiful. Everything in proportion, body, face, and hair coat. They stay beautiful for the first couple of years. And then again, do another slide into an adolescent stage not dissimilar to humans. A gap tooth look with new permanent teeth way too big for their faces. Hair tufts perpetually sticking up all around their heads always a tad on the grimy, sweaty, and little boy stinky side. They are blissfully unaware and uncaring that they are a bit of a mess. And then they shoot out the other side into adulthood and are transformed into these magnificently noble and gorgeous creatures. Adolescent gorillas have a bluster about them. There is a lot of stamping of feet, stiff-legged run-bys accompanied by the pock, pock, pock of chest beats, the tough guy routine but it's really all for nothing. It takes only one annoyed adult female to voice her complaint via cough grunt, <coughs> which elicits a response from the silverback male who slowly lumbers to his feet, standing stiff legged with lips pulled in in irritation and the youngsters fold into themselves, all bravado forgotten as they sheepishly and conveniently find another place to be. And now I want to go into uh, the slideshow for you. And let me reduce this a little bit. Just a few fast facts for you guys, because um, I want to put this into perspective that many of the gorillas that I worked with when I started working in the early 1980s all the way through around 1996 had been wild caught gorillas. So if you read my book, you'll know that that's a quite a traumatic experience for gorillas, but I just wanna give you some backgrounds of where we were and where we're at now. So these are the, the most recent numbers I could find. As of 2012, there were 856 gorillas in captivity and more than 700 of which were born in captivity. 
And if you look at that in comparison to in 1991, when I was working directly with gorillas, there were 622, 692 gorillas in captivity, only 371 had been born in captivity. So in essence, um, a little less than half at that time had been wild caught. And those were the animals that I was working with, both captive, but also many of them were wild caught. Only Western lowland gorillas are in US zoos. There are no mountain gorillas in captivity. 47 US zoos currently house gorillas. Um, estimates vary for the number of Western lowland gorillas, which is what you see in um, uh, US zoos in the wild, but somewhere, uh, somewhere over 100,000 actually occur in the wild in the Congo River Basin. And those are countries like Republic of Congo, Gabon, uh, Cameroon, and others. And the most endangered primate species in Africa is the Cross River Gorilla, which is considered to be a subspecies of the Western Lowland Gorilla and with an estimated 300. And this, I'm just gonna point out this female very quickly. This is Ponji with her son Colby. And at the very end, I'm gonna show you a video with Ponji and her son in it. But I think that's just a beautiful photo of a, of a, a mother gorilla. Gorilla troop makeup. Um, just uh, so everyone is aware, gorillas live in large, highly social groups. Um, they are led by an adult male called the silverback. There's a, usually a, back, a backup male called a blackback. Um, multiple females, and that number can range from two to five to 10 to more to 15. Um, because of the, depending on the amount of, of the females in the group, there are multiple youngsters from newborns to older infants to juveniles. The silverback protects the troop with his backup, the black up, uh, the black back. Silverbacks and all adults are incredibly tolerant of their youngsters. And I would really just say the word indulged. They are so tolerant sometimes when you're watching it, you think, oh my gosh, why don't you discipline that kid? But they, they really are just the most lovely of parents with their offspring and other kids offspring, truthfully. A simple, a simple cough grunt, which sounds like <laughs> that's enough to let the youngsters know that they're getting too rambunctious and they're out of line. Um, and that'll pretty much stop what they're doing. Um, and sometimes all it takes, as, as what I just said when I read you that brief um, excerpt, is just for a silverback to stand up and look slightly annoyed at the troop members and, and then everybody just sort of settles down. Super simple, very subtle. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my time in the ape house. And I think a lot of it was just luck. I think it was hard work. I think it was, I was there, I showed up at the right time and started volunteering at the zoo. And eventually that turned into part-time jobs and seasonal jobs. And then eventually I did end up in the ape house. And I think that is as much about showing up and just sticking it out when you don't even know where it's gonna go. But eventually I figured out gorillas were, were where I really wanted to be. And I feel so, I felt incredibly lucky when I was actually doing the work. And years later, my fellow keepers and I, when we get together, we'll talk about it and say, it was a time of magic. There's no doubt about it. There was never another time that felt like that. And these are my fellow keepers. This is Diana Frisch on the left-hand side. She was the head keeper when I first started. Then there's me, Adele Apsey, and Charlene Gendry. And it is these four women that really came together every morning, sitting at the coffee, at our uh, kitchen table in the back of the ape house after we did our morning routine. And we would start to talk about what we could do to make a difference and how we could change the zoo world and how we could change the husbandry techniques that were then being used in the early 1980s with gorillas. Again, lucky stars, all of us showed up at the same time. And I think, I love this quote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. And this is Jack Hanna and his wife, Susie. This was a trip to Botswana um, that I happened to be on. And I, I just wanna say this about Jack. Jack was not a micromanager. He supported his staff. He didn't get in the middle of the daily operations of what we were doing at the keeper level. And yet he set a tone without even stating it that the sky was the limit if we were, were willing to put the hard work in and make the changes. And he was never afraid of pushing back against what were current trends. 
Um, he just simply believed in his staff. And, and, and again, it's not like we made these major changes in the APAS without talking to our, our curator and talking to the assistant director. We had long, deep conversations about where we wanted to take this husbandry program for gorillas. But the reality is we had a leadership style that was from the top down that allowed us to be free thinkers and use our imagination. And really importantly, because, and, and this was, I think, because we were so well prepared, we really thought out these major changes we wanted to implement. We were given the latitude to make mistakes. And I think when you have that, when you're not always looking over your shoulder, thinking, oh my gosh, what if, what if this is a really bad idea? What if somebody gets hurt? Um, what if it's, it's just a screwy idea to begin with? We, ne- we always felt like we had that that the zoo itself, the management style had our back without interfering with what we did every day. And they valued the keeper knowledge. Now, bear in mind, this is starting back in 1982. That was unheard of then. And it's a much better now, of course, but we knew we were in a fortunate position to work at a zoo that believed in the keeper staff. Um, I love this quote again. Um, this was This was an audacious, Um, a building of a cage structure in 19, it was completed in 1984. And the reason why I say that is because at that time, uh, all the zoos were saying, oh, we can't keep these animals in barred cages. And they were right. Uh, We need to get them into naturalistic exhibits and we don't want any barriers to the public. Um, So we're gonna give them big big pieces of land or semi big pieces of land that's just flat and kind of boring to be perfectly honest. And we didn't feel that was the right way to go. We felt that if we gave gorillas a three-dimensional exhibit that they could maneuver and decide how to move on, maneuver on a daily basis to choose where they wanted to be in relation to what was going on in their troop, um, that that was the way to go. And that we would automatically be able to lower stress within any tr- troop that we had because they were making choices in their daily lives Who do I wanna interact with in this group? Who do I wanna stay away from? And do I have a way to stay away from them? And as you can see, because this is a three dimensional exhibit, they could go anywhere up and over anything that was going on in that exhibit. And I think it was, again, a brilliant move. I think we got some pushback from the zoo world, like, why are you doing this? Um, And one person even said, well, well, it looks like they're in captivity and it's like, well, they are in captivity. So let's just start, let's just put that on the table and recognize our, our thing with the Columbus Zoo was how do we create an environment for the gorillas that works for the gorillas that they are comfortable in, that we can build a troop to a relatively high number of 10 troop members, 12 troop members, 16 troop members, and they live together working out their own hierarchies, their own social issues without us interfering. And we would give them what they needed and then they would get on with their gorilla lives. So what we were trying to do was mimic how best to give them what they needed to behave as gorillas in a captive setting that would somehow mimic what you would see with their counterparts in the wild. And we were gonna do that any way that worked for the gorillas and we didn't really care what it looked like. We created, and this was this was in 1987. We created, a, we called it the surrogate surrogate program. And in essence, what we were doing was we recognized that there were decades and generations of gorilla babies being pulled automatically from their moms. There were always reasons why, oh, she doesn't have enough milk, which is probably wasn't true. Oh, she's not social. She doesn't know what she's doing. Well, it was really because zoos didn't have the proper exhibits. They didn't give the animals privacy. Now we're talking about the 60s and 70s and such like, and moving it a little bit into the 80s. And so here is all this, these generations, several generations of youngsters that have been pulled. And we said, well, why don't we create our own gorilla troop using adoptive moms and dads? And that way these kids, they'll be briefly raised in the nursery, but they'll be treated like gorillas in the nursery. They'll be brought down to the ape house on a daily basis. They'll see gorillas, smell gorillas, uh, interact with gorillas through the mesh while a keeper is holding them. And then eventually we will introduce them to the particular gorilla, be it male or female, that's interested in becoming the surrogate mom or dad. And that's exactly what we did. And this is Colo. As you know, Colo was the first gorilla born in captivity. And she became our sur- first surrogate 
uh, um, mom to this youngster that's right in front of her on the right hand side of the screen, that's JJ, and the twins are surrounding her. And I just want to make this point, see what she's doing. She's eating something quite lovely. I don't, not sure what it is, but you notice that all the boys, they are being polite. They are begging. They would like a piece of whatever it is she's eating, but they're being respectful. And that's because she's the adult. And part of the reason as well why we wanted to do the surrogate group is not only to have these babies raised within uh, groups that gorillas would teach them how to be gorillas, but we also knew that many, that these adults needed the responsibility and had not been given that opportunity to be the ones, to be the adults in the family, to set the parameters of what is acceptable behavior and what isn't. And we knew the best uh, animals to do that, of course, were gorillas teaching gorillas how to be gorillas. At the same time, in 1986, we had our first mother-father uh, reared infant named Fossey. This is Bongo. You'll see him in the background. That's a silverback. This was his fourth offspring. He had never been able, uh, given the opportunity to help raise his three offspring um, back in the late 60s and early 70s, who, who uh, he and Cola was the mother and he was the father. So this was the first opportunity that he was uh, left to be a typical silverback male, which is they stay with their female when she's giving birth. And um, he's, a, he's an integral part of the group. And, and the other thing is, it, once a baby is born, it is always the mom who is in charge. And it is a wise silverback who knows that. What we did was we changed gorilla husbandry, not just at the Columbus Zoo, but what we hoped was that we would create a model that would then go out into the zoo world and start to make people rethink the way they were building exhibits or the way they were housing gorillas, or quite honestly, the way they were pigeonholing um, and, and labeling gorillas. I mean, there was a big myth when I first started in the early 80s about gorillas being non-social and they don't know how to be gorillas and all of it, was sort of laying the blame at the feet of the very animals that were uh, having to deal with bad management decisions on, on, on any, at any number of zoos. Um, so again, luckily we worked at a zoo where we were able to think outside of that. And we decided this is the direction we're going. We, wanted, we not, not only wanna give the, these animals the best lives they can possibly have, and it wasn't just the gorillas, by the way, at the Columbus Zoo. When word got out of what we were doing, we were getting gorillas coming in from all over the country because they knew what we were doing. And just to get uh, to, to the story of why this book came about, um, originally this book was really, I had hoped would be slated and published as just a series of short essays and short stories about my experiences with the gorillas. And from my, the reaction that I got from reading these stories with a writer's group I've belonged to for a number of years now, I decided to pursue it and um, got in touch with Ohio State University Press and said, hey, I have this idea about this book. Would you guys be interested? And they wrote back and they read the, the, the short stories I sent and they said, yes, we're interested, but would you be willing to do it in the form of a, in the format of a memoir? And I, quite honestly, wasn't, didn't really want to do a memoir. Um, but I had had an experience years ago where I was working on another book and I lost an agent because I wasn't really that responsive to her. So I learned my lesson. And so I said to them, you bet, you want me to write a memoir based on these experiences with gorillas? That's what I'll do. So that's what I did. I started it in October, November of 2016. <clears throat> and the final draft was three years later in like November of 2019. So it's a long, slow process. You learn, you learn great patience when you're doing this. And the reason why I wanted to do, to do this book is because to me, their stories were so compelling, each and every one of them, certainly the ones that were captured from the wild because they bring that trauma of what they went through. And just to let you know, back in the day when you were allowed to capture gorillas from the wild, the silverback male would be killed. They would be surrounded by a group of men um, intent on getting a baby gorilla. And of course the silverback would be killed because he was the protector. Then the blackback would be killed. And then any other group member that happened to interfere and then they would kill the mother and they would take the baby off the mother. So think about that. 
what those animals went through that more that more than half of the animals I worked with when I was at the Columbus Zoo um, were wild caught. So they all went through that trauma of their capture. Um, and that is just mind boggling when you think about it. And these are super sensitive animals. Um, and also weirdly enough, very um, gracious animals as well. Sometimes I was a little bit amazed that they could even tolerate us at times, but I felt it was important to tell their stories. This was actually, this, this is T Tony who recently passed away and she was one of Colo and Bongo's um, kids. And she notoriously did not raise her babies and she had babies all the time. And, and it's not, and we tried everything when we started changing the program around and she still wouldn't, or, and I think it's because she had so many babies pulled in, in the early days and, and it was just kind of a traumatic experience for her. But here's the cool thing. She passed away, I don't know, maybe a year ago or so, but by the end of her life, you know, at the age of 40, well, how old was she? She was born in 71. Um, she was 40, late 40s. She was raising other, other females' babies. She was a surrogate mom, which I absolutely love that she came full circle and decided, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to be a surrogate mom now. This is Bongo. And I just want to briefly say that probably the biggest reason behind this book is because of this particular animal. I felt as a really strong connection to and kinship to this animal. I had a huge amount of respect for him. Um, he was kind of like, you know, that wise old person that you meet or someone, someone who inspires you so much that you would just hope that they would like you or at least accept you. And that's how he sort of affected me. Um, and I do want to make a point about this. If you look at this, I'm holding my hair out to him because he wants to smell it. But look at how he's placed his hands. His hands, he's got the back of his hands against the mesh. And basically what he's saying is, I'm not gonna grab you, Beth. You know, my hands are away from you. I can't grab you. And so this is the, the thing that you learn with gorillas. You interact with them when they ask you to interact. Never, ever, ever do you presume to approach and touch a gorilla if they have not asked you in their body language or their facial expressions or their vocalizations that they would like to interact with you. And I have to say, when they do it, it's the greatest of compliments. But again, I stress this, you would never presume to approach a gorilla that did not ask you first. I wanted to share their complicated lives, that they live very social lives, that there are social, there's social climbing within the troops. There's deep friendships between females. Um, there's uh, deep partnerships between males and females. There's also uh, a real camaraderie, camaraderie with the youngsters and you know, playing together and some, some are buds with others and some don't like the other ones so much. So it's, it's really, really similar to, see, to seeing what you would see on like your neighborhood block with, if it's loaded with lots of kids of, of different ages. They're extremely gentle and nurturing. It was rare that you would ever see um, an adult discipline an infant with any kind of physical, phys any kind of physicality. It usually just was a cough grunt or maybe a quick run by, but, but it was rare that you would ever see them hit, hit an animal. They're very tolerant of their youngsters. This is, they have a great sense of humor and they have a wonderful laugh. It's kind of a, <laughs> sound. A little bit higher with the, the in, infants. This is Fossey playing with his dad, Bongo. Bongo weighs well over 400 pounds and look at them. They both have open mouths, which indicates um, they're laughing and, and they have play faces on. And this is Oscar and he was one of Colo and Bongo's sons and he loved to either get in the pool in his other yard or he loved to have you spray him with the hose along his arms and in his mouth. So again, he would come over and sort of indicate to us, okay, Beth, you've got the hose. Can you get, can you do this for me? And that's what you did. We interacted them in different ways. You know, one day Charlene brought in some bubbles and, and just sat with a youngster and did this and it was just something goofy and different to do. Why tell their stories? Well, I think because they're individuals and they're as, they're as equally unique as we are um, because they care about their families as deeply as we do. 
because they're great parents, because they have a lot of a lot to teach us about tolerance and uh, the ability to adapt and being reserved and dignified. Um, yeah, I think they I think they are a great bridge animal, a bridge species for people to really feel a great connection to other species to, to respect them for what they are, not in relation to us or not what they can do for us or not how we interact with them, but just simply in their own right. They are to be respected and cared for and protected because they simply matter. You know, this is just the tenderness between a mother and an infant. This is Fossey when he was a youngster in the crook, crook of his mom's arms. They teach their youngsters the ins and outs of what you're supposed to do when you're in a big group setting and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, a father's gentleness, I think, um, you know, male gorillas in particular, they sort of get this big hype thing, the King Kong thing, but the, the truth of the matter is most male gorillas that I worked with, they didn't want any trouble. They were, they were quiet, they, they're dignified, um, they, they really didn't want drama in their life. If they had to deal with issues, of course they would, but they're really quite gentle animals and they would just prefer to be left alone and get on with the business of raising their families. And this is Bongo in the front with Fosse in the back, just totally following his father everywhere, which is what he did on a daily basis. And again, why tell their stories? because it was an honor and a privilege to be in their presence every single day. There wasn't a day, even when, you know, it's hard physical work, it's mentally difficult, you worry a lot, um, you're trying to make these big differences, but you worry about their health or if someone gets ill or there's a problem pregnancy, all of these things, they weigh on you. Um, but the reality is the fact that they could even accept us was this sense of privilege um, on a daily basis. And if you were to talk to, I was thinking about this. It, I said there were 47 zoos in the, in the U.S. that have gorillas. Well, let's just say, just round it off to 50. And let's just say there's of 50 zoos with gorillas. Let's say there's five keepers that are dedicated to gorillas on the staff of each zoo, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's probably not a whole lot. So that's 250 people. So take that up to just to be generous, take it up to maybe there's maybe 300 people in this country that actually work with directly with gorillas on a daily basis. That's part of the privilege part is that it's a rare group. It's a small group that actually gets to interact with these animals. And you feel that, or at least I did. And I think my fellow keepers definitely did as well. It's a relationship based on trust and respect, reading their body language, um, um, knowing when to uh, interact with them or not interact with them. Um, and I feel like they have so much to teach us through their dignity, through their for forbearance, for all that they've been through, especially those that had been, again, many of those animals have now passed away, uh, the ones that were captured from the, from the wild and were placed in pretty awful conditions for the, you know, in the 60s and 70s and even going into the early 80s until we changed everything. And I wanna bring this up and just because there's a lot of uh, discussion now about a, that you shouldn't put pictures up about you interacting with an animal. You know, again, we interacted with them because they asked us to through their vocalizations, again, body language, facial expressions. and and that was part of the job that not you weren't looking to do that it was but when it occurred you did it it's a sign of respect and i i, I think i just want to make that clear that this isn't playtime with the animals this is this female saying to me can you come on over here beth i'd like to do a little cuddle and i'm like okay great and also why write their stories? Because they seem to treat us as a friend. And, and later on, I'm gonna play you a video of this gentleman, Mr. Randy Reed, he's from the Birmingham Zoo. This is Ponji, um, which he actually called Susie. And he took care of Susie for the first 19 years of her life. And this is Colby, her, her son that she's raising. And I just wanna talk a little bit about Ponji just because 
I was the one that took the phone call probably in 19, in the mid 1980s, like 85 or something. And I was in the APAS work in, in the kitchen and we got a phone call from somebody at Birmingham. I don't know if it was a curator or director, but he, he literally said these things. She's not, she's, she's not social, she'll never breed. She doesn't know how to be with the male. Um, he laid all these things that we had been dealing with at Columbus. We, we were telling other zoos, hey, if you think there's something wrong with your gorilla, great, send her to us. We'll get her, get her, he or she into a group, no problem. So then he, then he said to me, um, and she's too old, she'll never reproduce. And I said to him, well, how old is she? And he said, 19. And I said, okay, um, let me get back to you. <laughs> I got off the phone, immediately went and found the head keeper, Diana. And then we went and talked to Dawn or she went and talked to Dawn. And it was like this mislabeling of gorillas and saying, they're not capable of this. They're not social. They're too old to breed. We didn't know what we were doing back then in the zoo world, but what we did know at the Columbus Zoo, our belief in that APAS was we were not going to label any of these animals, regardless what their, their background had been because we knew that zoos had not been housing them properly for at least two and a half decades. We knew that. And, and so it wasn't their fault that they weren't acting as gorillas. So, you know, good for us in a sense that everybody was like, hey, we'll just ship them off to Columbus. Well, it ended up, she ended up not only having her own babies at Columbus and raising them, but she also ended up being the premier surrogate mom in our big surrogate group and ended up being the dominant female in that group. So just goes to show, you just don't, you don't label animals. We honor them through their stories because their lives mattered and they continue to matter. And this, this male right here is actually Bongo's son. He was the first, this is Fosse. He was the first mother, father reared gorilla at the Columbus Zoo. And he was eventually sent to the Little Rock Zoo with, with his, I think it was, they were cousins. JJ was related to him somehow, I forget how. And um, he ended up having youngsters there and raising his babies with his mate as well. So just, just so you guys know this, you know, my book Voices from the Ape House is available at all the library systems, all the libraries here in Columbus. So you can just do that or feel free to purchase online at independent stores or Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And then this is just my contact information. And if you wanna to go to my website, it's uh, betharmstrongauthor.com. It's still a bit of a work in progress, but it's there. And I really, I absolutely love uh, the eloquence of John F. Kennedy's words uh, on so many different levels. But this one I think is so important. One person can make a difference and everyone should try. And I feel like at Columbus Zoo with the four keepers, the four of us in that ape house, it wasn't just one of us, it was four of us throwing in our ideas and fine tuning how we would do the logistics of changing husbandry. and and that becomes a great uh, lesson in working with people, but also one person throwing an idea out there and then everybody else, we just sit and we take it and we run with it. And I think it's so important in this day and age that people understand that you can make a difference. You just have to do it. And irregardless of whether or not you're labeled as rebels or wow, what are they doing over there? Just get out and do it because for us, the reason why we did the work that we did is because we cared so deeply for these animals and we really truly felt for me and I will just say this about me. I felt that all the changes we made at the Columbus Zoo were almost as as if we it was a, a deep apology for all that had happened to them in their lives. And so it was important for us to do positive changes throughout not only in the Columbus Zoo, but also uh, throughout the zoo world. And now I'm going to go ahead and pull up a couple of videos for you, just so you can see what was it like behind the scenes. And I'll show you Bongo, Bridget Fossey, I guess. Okay, so while you're watching this, bear in mind females, once they have, they're in charge. I don't care what, that's the mark of a good male that understands that the females are in charge. So watch, watch this. And I'll walk you through it. Walk you and talk you through it. Okay, so that's Bongo in the back. He's desperately trying to touch 
his son, let me move this, who is just, uh, who's not very old at this point. And Bridget, and the baby had just nursed, so the baby was zonked out and Bongo desperately wanted to touch his son. And Bridget was just having, Bridget was having none of it. So just watch this interaction. Look how he eyeballs her, he side eyes her <laughs> to see if he can get it. And then she's like, nope, that's not gonna happen. And then he thinks about it a little bit, trying to come up with another plan. He keeps looking at Bridget. <laughs> and then he finally just says, well, that's not gonna happen, I guess. Aww. And this stage, the way this baby is so zonked out, we used to call it the dead baby syndrome. It used to scare us when we first had mother rearing because once they had their fill of milk, they were exhausted and just, immediately fell asleep. So this is, this is Bongo and the baby, Fossey is climbing on him and Bridget is saying, well, that's enough of that. And she just pulls him off. And this is the three of them playing. This is Bongo with a, uh, this yellow ball that he's goofing around with. <laughs> oh God. And then Bridgie's sitting in an old flat tire that she liked. And this was a normal part of our day. After, now Bridget, watch this. Bridget, Bridget grabs the ball. She's got the ball now. And, and watch Bongo wants it. She won't give it to him. She's like, nope. So a lot, after we did the initial feeding and cleaning in the morning and got all the animals back together, we would sit and do observations. That was a big part of, an important part of our job was to actually watch the gorillas because that informed where we were gonna make our next move. And this is just Bongo and his son, Fossey, that I just wanna show very quickly. And I know this is, this is pretty scratchy looking. These are taken from old DVD, um, the old fashioned way of doing films. But look how gentle Bongo is with his son. And Bridget is in the background and she's watching every move he makes. She's all right with it for right now. And Bongo doesn't even look at the boy. Mrs. Bongo and Foss playing chase. And Fossey playing with his dad again. Look at how, you know, again, how incredibly gentle he is with this tiny kid. And they were absolutely the best of friends. I'm going to stop this here because I want, I want to show you, I'm going to show you this, this is an introduction of when, when I talked about our adoptive group, the surrogate group, um, this is the first infant that we introduced into that group. Colo chose to be uh, the surrogate mom. 
and the twins were in there. They were about five at the time. And then Cora, who was about 10 at the time, another female was in the group as well. So the reason why I wanna show it to you, because this is the first time that we let an unrelated silverback into this troop, hoping that this is gonna be the building block, the foundation for building a bigger, bigger troops to get more and more youngsters in. But, but just to say this, Male gorillas in the wild, mountain gorillas, these are mountain gorillas in the wild. If, if a male a silverback dies and the females have to disperse and they have infants from that male that died, they have to go find another male to protect them. And the new male will almost automatically take that baby from the female and kill it because there's nothing in his, there's no advantage to him to be raising some other silverbacks um, genetic material. He wants to impregnate that female himself and that's the only way it's gonna happen. So we knew that. And so this was highly unusual that we were trying something by introducing an unrelated male to a youngster. And we weren't sure what he was gonna do. We did, we did constant observations, watching him interact through the mesh, but we were not sure what was gonna happen. So bear in mind, that the twin gorillas were quite rough with JJ the baby when he was introduced and Cola would have to discipline them. But watch what happens when the silverback male crosses over into the cage. All the gorillas, all the gorillas, including the twins, surround that baby in a protective sort of womb um, to see what Momba does, to come to that baby's aid in case Momba does anything to the baby. So with that background, take a look at this. The silverback is the biggest one there. He's up on the, the top ledge on the right. Alliances that were formed between group members and the infant appear to have benefited the infant when the adult male was introduced. The infant did not sustain any injuries during his introduction and was fully integrated into group three after 59 days. Now watch what the twins do. They do a little thing right there. It's kind of a distraction. It's a way to distract the male. But look at the twins, they're, they're stiff leg. they're staying in front of that baby. That's the baby they beat up on. <laughs> and this had never been done in a zoo, this integration of an unrelated male, as far as we knew. And then eventually this troop ended up being, I think, at one point, I think we might have had 16 members in it. We ended up having like five females, lots of infants. And we started getting other zoos sending us their infants uh, because the mothers weren't raising them at that, that particular zoo. So we started getting zoos or, or Oklahoma City Zoo sent us a babies and there were other zoos that were sending us babies because they were having, and we had the right setup. We knew the, how to do this. Okay, this is the last thing I wanna show you. It's only three and a half minutes. It's from a National Geographic special called The Urban Gorilla. You can still buy it online and I would, I would strongly recommend that you do it because it's a brilliant uh, documentary on captive gorillas. It was done back in 1991 and it's a series of about six or seven stories, two stories in, in the UK, one in the UK, one in, 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 in Holland, both of those places we had suggested to the producer and the writer that they needed to go over and look at those facilities too. But the real kernel for this was this story between Randy Reed from the Birmingham Zoo and his relationship with Ponji. Now, when you see this, Ponji and Randy have not seen each other for three and a half years. She has not heard his voice for three and a half years. So when Randy arrived at the zoo, we had to keep Ponji away and we had to uh, keep his voice down so that she wouldn't have any idea that he was there. I was the one that let Ponji through the tunnel system from her, her other exhibit into the big caged exhibit. And I have never seen that animal move like that, had never seen it. And her hair coat immediately stood up in excitement when she ran towards his voice. So watch this. In Columbus, Ohio, a breeding loan has meant a new life for 22 year old Ponji. Until three and a half years ago, Ponji lived in isolation at the Birmingham Zoo. She had never bred. 
Today, Panji is raising her second son. Here in Columbus, little Colby enjoys life within a family, a happy testament to a successful breeding loan. But there's another side to Panji's story. When she was transferred from Birmingham, Panji left behind a longtime friend and keeper, Randy Reed. It made a big change in my life when she left. Uh, I was with this animal for 20 years, maybe a little over 20 years. And she was one of my best friends. I worked with her every day. And uh, it's been three and a half years since I've seen her. Later, Reed traveled to Columbus to see the gorilla he'd raised from infancy. Neither he nor Panji's new keeper, Diana Frisch, knew how his old friend would react. For nearly four years, Panji hadn't heard Reed's familiar voice, or the name he used to call her, Susie. I think she will remember me. Of course, I'm hoping that she will. Okay, I'm just gonna say this really quickly. What you see happen between Randy and Panji slash Susie did not happen with us as keepers. She, Ponji was a kind of very cool, independent female gorilla that just wanted us to do what we needed to do so that she could get on with her daily life of being a gorilla. She did not interact with us that much. We certainly weren't allowed to touch her baby. So I'm just saying, keep that in mind when you watch this. What I'd like to start with is trying to have an opportunity for Panji to see Randy by herself. But if she Randy, realizes we'll Oscar's gone, away. yeah, then we better open it up and get him just, back through. And we'll go ahead and uh, okay. work from there. Just let's just wing it, play it by okay. ear, see what happens. Great. Yeah, Oscar's gonna stop first. Over here. Sure, if she'll come over. Uh, she's over if you want to give her a call. Susie, come here, Susie. Susie, come here, Susie. Come here. Come on. Come on, Susie. Come on. Come here, Susie. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let me, Susie. Come here. Come on. When you're working with animals like this, you establish your relationship, and then when it has to be severed, it's pretty much of a, a, an emotional thing. You lose part of your life. You lose one of your better friends. And it's difficult to deal with after you've been at it for a few years. But I knew she was going to a better place. I knew it was something that was for her benefit. And whatever was for her benefit, I was for that. What you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. You always tell people who would ask me, are they friendly to you and so forth? And I'd tell them they're a couple of my best friends. And people would be amazed to hear something like that. But it was really true. Uh, I felt like I could trust Susie more than I could the person that walked up and down the street. And I mean that. That's true. Okay. That's it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone else. Is that like the <laughs> best? <laughs> I, watch it, I watch it 30 years later and I'm like, and you know what, when my book came out, I called Randy, I was able to track him down. And I'm like, Randy, I need to send you a copy of the book because you're in it. And, um, and he was just the most, he was just a gentleman. He was a gentleman. He, this was the biggest, it was, I don't think we could have imagined anything better. I mean, we were all stunned and, and I'm not kidding. Ponty was galloping. <laughs> we never saw her do that again. Ever and reaching out to him and oh, oh my, my god. god I I what what a lovely lovely relationship they had just oh, wonderful my. yeah oh, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. so yeah thank you for showing us yeah oh those videos that was oh. I know I, I think about it that's what we did every day is we that was 
And because again, we could not make a next step in an introduction process, whether or not it was a, an adult that had come in from another zoo to another adult at our zoo or a juvenile to an adult. It was all, and that's why we were really organized to getting our work done. And, and plus we wanted the gorillas to get back together as soon as possible so they could get on with their gorilla daily life. And that's where you get all the pieces of the puzzle. That's where you see, oh, somebody's making a power play. That's interesting. <laughs> I didn't see it coming. I mean, and it's like a little soap opera in a way. Yeah. Or, they do, or they do incredibly funny, goofy things that they, and I know, I know that Bongo, and Bongo wasn't the only one, but Bongo really would do things because he knew that he could get you to laugh. <laughs> It's that privilege you're talking about. It's such a such a gift. Well, I have a couple of questions and comments here that I want to get to. Okay. Uh, the first one is, okay, what was the impact of the pandemic on the gorillas at the uh, at Columbus and other zoos? Mm -hmm. Well, you know that some of the the gorillas out at San Diego, I think it was the Wild Animal Park, they did test positive for COVID. Okay. Um, and I'm, I haven't been out to the zoo. I'm, I'm very cautious about um, this virus. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I haven't gone. I usually go out and take photographs because I do photography as well. And um, so I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. how it was, you know, how, how it affected them. Cause you, cause you also talk about how, um, you know, the importance of facial expressions. So yeah. questions about, yeah, were the keepers wearing masks? Well, here's the deal, and I do bring this, and it's kind of odd, because I do bring it up in the book. I, I was never a fan. Um, yes, they, they would have to wear a mask. They, and they were already wearing masks. They had started to, even before the virus, I noticed that Columbus had started to become one of the zoos that just automatically had their keepers wear masks. No. Um, there were other zoos, Bush Gardens did it decades ago. I was never a fan of it. We never did it because I always felt like they needed to see us as well, our facial expressions. Right. But of course, now with the, the virus, I mean, I, I, I don't think it'll ever change again. That Of course, it'll always be masks. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Do you think the gorillas enjoyed the absence of visitors during that time? You know, do some get... I'll, I'll be honest with you. I know that they always liked, you know, because, and I didn't talk about this, but, but you know, though that exhibit that you saw with a lot of the introduction of Mumba and JJ and Colo and the twins, and then Bongo and Fossey and doing all that. And those exib exhibits looked beat up and stuff, but I'm telling you, they love that building. And that building used to be the 1950s building that was just this barred cage. And then there was a keeper aisle and plexiglass, a stone wall, and then, then it was all public. And then a bench of this big cement bench. And we kept, we actually, when we built that outdoor cage structure, mm -hmm. which works really well for gorillas, um, we shut that building down to the public, the adjoining building. And we elongated all the cages, meshed it over, did double doors front and back so nobody could ever get trapped, so they could have roundabouts, mm -hmm. had a chute system, filled in all the dead space on the walls with handholds and footholds. And that's the other thing, you have to think like that when you walk into an ex enclosure. If I were a gorilla and there were another gorilla in this troop that I don't like, where could I get trapped if they came towards me? And so you always had to think that that wall is a dead space, how do we fix that for gorillas? So we had a lot of climbing structures and corner double decker beds and footholds and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's that old building that we renovated. And the fact that the zoo allowed that to happen in 1984 to shut that entire building down to the public was amazing because it was the best thing for the animals and it mm -hmm. gave them the privacy that they so desperately needed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we were again, lucky. Lucky stars, right place, right time, right management, you mm -hmm. know, right people. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And also the challenge was there. Something needed to happen mm -hmm. in terms of changing things. And, and I think we just came together at the right time, you know, and yeah. were able to do it, so. Another question. Um, so you wrote about how Diane Fossey put your gorillas at ease with the way she approached them when meeting them for the first time. Yeah. What's the ideal 
way for zoo visitors to approach gorilla enclosures in terms of posture and facial expressions in their house? Don't look at them directly. Okay. Um, kind of put your head down mm -hmm. and don't stare. That's a direct threat. Um, don't do, you know, move a lot. Just have a very relaxed demeanor um, and just quietly watch them. Just don't do a direct stare. Kind of just look over to the side and, um, you know, the exhibit is big enough, the outdoor exhibit, that I don't think they care that much. And the cool thing I like about that exhibit as well, because, you know, the crowds can get quite large because I used to work the sat Saturday night late shift. And then we had members night on Wednesday. So I would work that a lot too. And um, when the crowds are really large, what's really nice for gorillas is we had tunnels, you know, they could go sit in, they had climbing structures, but they could just go sit above the crowd. And I think that's a real psychological advantage that you're not in this fishbowl being looked down on, which is already you're vulnerable and you're, and I would feel threatened if I were in, in that type of exhibit. So that's, that was the other advantage to the cage structure structure is if they became annoyed with the public because they, they were loud or there were too many or whatever, they could just go up and take a bunch of nesting materials. And we had benches all over the place. They could just go up on top and, and sit up there or get in the middle far away from the people and just sort of hide. We had hills and all sorts of stuff that they could hide behind. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's nice. Um, a comment. Um, that last story was so sweet. Thank you for all the wonderful work you've done with gorillas and for sharing it with the wider world. Oh, thank you. Um, another question. Okay, genetic diversity is a concern for endangered species in zoos. Are zoos using artificial insemination or other methods successfully with gorillas? Hmm. Mm, I'm not a big fan of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a lot of, um, yes, they have done it. Yeah, they have done it. Um, um, and, and it, and the way it is now, because there's a lot of operant conditioning going on, they could, they can do certain things without having to anesthetize an animal, um, to do an examination, but it really comes down to their social creatures and they need to be able to work this out. So it's not really a necessary tool in my book. And I think it's been in the past, certainly in the back in the 80s and sometimes in the 90s, it was a disrupt, very uh, disruptive um, thing to do to, to gorillas. Mm -hmm. So they can't just waltz into a OBGYN office and be, and my, I'm married to an OBGYN and, and he actually helped with gorillas. So it's, you know, you really kind of want to stay away from messing around with uh, doing uh, physical exams like that and having to do that, separating them out from troops. And um, I'm, I'm not, a, not a huge fan. And I don't think it's really necessary uh -huh. in this situation. Yeah. Okay. Do you feel like your, um, your work had a ripple effect, well, in other zoos, but even with other species, um, other apes at the Columbus Zoo? I mean, in terms of the way they were going to approach. Um, yeah, I think the bonobos. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That, that definitely. Um, because when I was still in gorillas, they brought, we brought in the bonobos and that just started with two males and two females. And now it's, I think the Columbus Zoo probably has the best troop of bonobos that look the best, that act like bonobos, that are comfortable within their own skin in where they're living. Um, and I worked with them along with my fellow keepers before we split the departments. But yeah, that same type of thing. That I do think that, that what we did in gorillas probably influenced that very common sense. They'll tell us what they need and let's listen to what they're telling us. And then let's, let's do what they are saying. Come on, this is what we need. And that's why I think that program is so darn good and so successful. It's a lot of common sense. Yeah, um, and not interfering and trying the latest scientific thing. It's, it's they're highly social. They will figure things out. Just give them the right space and the right bedding and the right outlet from one another, um, the right diet. Um, they'll they'll figure it out. Yeah, 
And I mean, do you feel like that attitude now is more prominent at zoos? Like they're more conservation? Oh, God. Well, yeah, I think they do think like that in terms of housing. I still don't, you know, you still didn't see that many cages, cages, exhibits, enclosures built like what we build out of the Columbus Zoo. Mm -hmm. So I still think it's an excellent, it is. It so is. It, it works for gorillas. There's a reason why we could create a big troop and put them out there. Um, and I'm, I question whether or not we could have done that. And it was a limited amount of space we had, obviously. See how big the, the ground level is, but then triple that because you're up and above and you've got all this other stuff going on, so. Yeah, does it, do we have the biggest troop in the US? I mean, does the Columbus- I think, I think, no, not anymore, we don't. Um, I, I, we did at one time, I think. And I, th I think Zoo Atlanta was always close, but I think they're the ones, I think Zoo Atlanta may have the biggest troop now. I think, yeah. Yeah, it was funny, I saw um, an article from the Guardian about a surrogate mom gorilla in the UK. And I went, oh, isn't that funny? Yeah. Isn't that funny sitting around that kitchen table? <laughs> came up with that phrase and wow. knew what it meant and where we were going with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's all good. I mean, nowadays, like if you obviously you see moms raising babies in bigger groups, yeah, it's all happening now. But again, I think the challenge for us was there was such great change that was needed. And, and that was the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Because when you, it was the same thing with conservation. You know, there were a lot of zoos not doing conservation. And we were talking about this last night at, when I gave another lecture um, that, you know, we started this conservation conference at the Columbus Zoo in 1995 called Zach, Zoos and Aquariums Committing to Conservation. Because at that point, we were already five years into being very committed with our funding and any kind of support we could give to field people all around the world. And we were doing a lot of great ape stuff because I, you know, because I was pretty active. And, but it wasn't just great ape stuff. It was elephants, bongo antelope. It was all over the map. We were doing stuff in Guatemala. We were doing stuff in Chile, everywhere, our, all sorts of African nations. Mm -hmm. And we felt in 1995 we we hosted this conference because we felt that there weren't enough zoos doing support of work around the world, and yet. Every zoo you go to will talk about how important it is to conserve these areas and to conserve these animals in the wild. Well, at that point, and now we're looking, what, 30 years, not quite 30 years ago, but, you know, they were talking, but they weren't, they weren't walking the walk. So we thought, well, let's have a conference and let's start throwing, let's bring in our field partners so that they can let zoos know why it's advantageous for them to support them. And then also for us to show models of, this is another common sense approach. Just do it. Build relationships with people around the world. Keep your word. Don't make promises you can't keep. Follow through. You don't have to start with a huge amount of money. Use that small grant as a bridge to start to build and build and build on that relationship. And then look for conservation projects that are community-based on the ground level. Not a big organ conservation organization up here that that $2,000 we might give would mean nothing to them but you give it to a small organization that's trying to build their reputation, it can mean, it can be a lifeline. So that's why we did Zach. And, um, and Zach continues still, Zach still goes on. We, had, we did have to cancel last year, Zach, that the Utah's Ho Hogel Zoo was gonna host because of COVID. Um, and, gorilla, and also I forgot to mention, you know, in 1990, in the APAS, we said, let's, we had already been doing a publication that we were putting together with other keepers writing it from all over the world because we felt like we we were given our voice but they didn't necessarily have a voice at their zoo but we could give them a voice through a publication and we knew that gorilla keepers had all the answers to the problems that were facing captive gorillas in the late 80s so we took it one step further and decided said well what if we do this what if we host an international meeting called the gorilla workshop and bring people from the field and bring people from Europe and Holland and elsewhere and US zoos and let's all sit down and talk about how do we make this big shift 
so that we're doing right by gorillas. And that's still a conference that's going on still. We had to cancel that one too last year. It was going to be held in Prague. But these ideas that germinated in an ape house kitchen table, at an ape house kitchen table, having coffee, these things still go on. Yeah. So wonderful. Oh my God. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. Um, comment. Yeah, what an enjoyable presentation. Thanks for your important work and your wonderful book. And I would say, yes, thank you so much for your leadership. Oh, you're welcome. It's, you know, it's, it's really changed the field for the better. Yeah. yeah. So inspiring. So, yeah. yeah, and your love of gorillas is, you know, just infectious. So thank you because, so much. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> when you watch them, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> they make you laugh. They, yeah, they're goofy and they're incredibly lovely. They're just lovely animals. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. So thank you again. Okay. Good and pleasure. let me know if you decide you're going to be doing some live stuff. I'm happy to do it anytime. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope our next meeting for everyone here is, is in person. Okay. Uh, no, no. Thank you so much. You're and welcome. You everyone. And, <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you. All right.